and we can go ahead. So welcome everyone once again to another uh, of our sessions for our student talks. As I said, it's a little bit modest to, to call uh, this a student talk uh, from Seth, but still we are very happy to have uh, Seth Asanta here with us. Seth uh, studied initially at the African Institute for Mathematics and Sciences um, for his bachelor's where he also returned as a tutor some years later. And he did his PhD at Perimeter with uh, Bianca Dietrich and Lee Smolin. Currently, he is doing a postdoc at the University of Vienna with Sebastian Steinhaus on the topic precisely of uh, spin from quantum gravity. I believe that uh, Seth's interests, academic interests, uh, cover a wide range of topics, but in particular, I would point them out to be, I have my notes here, well, besides spin from quantum gravity, of course, uh, topological field theories, holography, and general mathematical physics. Seth, Seth will, uh, as I mentioned, talk about effective spin forms uh, for quantum gravity. We are very excited to hear you, Seth. Please go ahead. Let me just mention the talk will uh, take 15 minutes approximately. You will be able to ask questions during the talk if you wish to do so. Seth is very uh, happy to welcome those questions. And we also have an anonymous Google form for any questions that you might want to ask anonymously. You can find the link for that both at the chat of our Zoom meeting, as well as um, in our server at, on Discord. So please, Seth, go ahead. Um, we're very happy to have you. Okay. Thank you, Jesse. Um, I'm also very happy to be here, um, I see. Um, first of all, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to um, give like a presentation about the recent work I've done. Um, um, yeah, I'm happy that I have two of the organizers in my, I share an office with two of the organizers, so um <laughs> it's really nice yeah and thank you for the good job you're doing i think it's a very nice organization um okay so today i will tell you about effective spin forms for quantum gravity um and okay maybe i'll just go right in so this is a fairly recent work that um i did together with bianca hal and jose um recently so in the 2020 um that's just around the time before I finished my PhD. That's when we started this work. Um, and if you, yeah, if you're interested, you can check these three papers. There's a short article on PRL, uh, which contains, you know, like a bit pedagogical information on how to get started with effective spin forms. Um, and also we um, started creating like a website on WordPress for effective spin forms. So if you check this, web page here it's still under construction so there's not too much information but you find some resources that maybe you can uh, check out for these effective spin forms and um, we hope that maybe we'll keep working on this so that it's it has more information okay so um i'll just go right in so the problem that um i'm interested in is quantum gravity and um so i think of it as trying to model what a quantum space-time will look like. And this is, of course, an old problem. It's not, it's not new. Um, um, and most approaches um, usually start, or they, they approach it via non perturbative methods. And that's the thing I'm also interested in. And when it comes to the non perturbative approaches, there are, there are several approaches out there. Um, I did not list any of them here because there are, are too many, but, um, I'm sure most of you here are also working in some of these aspects of non perturbative quantum gravity. Um, but for the purpose of this talk, I'll be interested in path integral approaches. Um, and if you think of path integral for quantum gravity, you will um, look at a partition function of this form. Um, if you think of gravity, um, as Einstein told us, like um, it's a property of the geometry of space. So, um, so what I have written here is a path integral over uh, some geometry of space-time. Um, and then you integrate over some uh, measure on your geometry of space-time. And this um, path integral method um, has, I mean, that's what most people would wanna do, but um, it has many questions, you know, for example, um, you have to first answer the question of, what's the degree of freedom that you are using to 
uh, in order to you know define have a well defined path integral, you have to specify what the degrees of freedom are. And um, yeah, so there are there are many um, schools of thought out there on what the degrees of freedom of gravity should be. Uh, there's the metric. There are also some uh, bivector variables, and you know there are there are different variables one can consider to be um, the degrees of freedom. And for example, if I'm in the Lorentzian setting, I can also ask, do I impose some causality conditions on the geometries that I allow? Do I allow topological changes in the evolution? You know, these are many questions that you can ask if you want to um, do this kind of path integral formulations. And there's even um, the question of how do we compute this Lorentzian path integral? You know, remember there's an I here for the action. So this is not a Euclidean action if you are doing Lorentzian action. Um, this integral will be very uh, highly oscillatory. So uh, you need some special methods. Um, I mean, in the past, people have resorted to doing a recrutation to go to the Euclidean formulation and then, um, yeah, and make sense of this path integral. But those formulations come with uh, the conformal factor problem, which is that your Euclidean action is unbounded from below. Um, and so and that's problematic, you know. Um, yeah, so how do we deal with this path integral? So these are the sort of questions that I'm interested in that I'll be talking about in, in this effective spin forms. Okay, so about the question of what are the fundamental degrees of freedom, I'll pick one. Um, so there are, I call them the area variables in four dimensions. Um, and there's actually a support, like yeah, a, a lot of support for this, for picking area degrees of freedom as your fundamental variables for describing what a quantum space time looks like. And I mean, I list here some of the uh, support that I, I found. So, I mean, if you work in spin forms and LQG, you already know that your degrees of freedom are bi vector variables, which are, um, yeah, they live on two dimensional surfaces. So, these are like sort of area variables. Um, and also, you know, I mean, I'm not going to go through all of them. If you, uh, if you think about uh, black hole entropy, the way they define it as um, it's proportional to area over 4G by area of your minimum surface. And if you think of black hole entropy as counting some microstates of your uh, theory, then, you know, it's somehow relating the area variables as their fundamental degrees of freedom. So these are some uh, vague arguments, but you know it supports that area variables are maybe the thing we should consider when talking about uh, spin forms. There are also um, many others, like you know uh, these corner edge modes, boundary variables. The corner uh, sources some, uh, you know, like here it, it's yeah in in these formulations. The, the your edge modes are sourced at the corner variables, which describe some area variables, you know, and that's all supports this choosing the area variables as your fundamental variables. Okay, so the question that I want to ask here is that um, if we pick area variables as a fundamental degrees of freedom to describe uh, what a quantum gravity will look like, what are the implications? Okay, so that's what effective spin forms tries to do. And so this is just the um, motivation for the talk. So okay. I, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, if it's too basic, you can always uh, sure. tell me. So, I mean, aren't we already doing that in, in LQG? We, we are using uh, what a spin network is. It, it describes the area degrees of freedom, doesn't it? Yes, yes. So, I mean, yes. So, yeah, that's what I said. So these are all support from some quantum gravity theories out there, which supports all these using these area variables. So, um, yes, so, but what I'm trying to do is, to, you know, I'm getting some feedback, is it? Different? Something different. What? So I'm just um, saying that, you know. No, I'm yeah, sorry, yeah. I got some reason. 
Uh, I thought it was okay to ask questions during the talk. If it's not, yes, yes, yes. no, 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 Deepak, you're, you're, of course, it's allowed to ask questions. I muted you because there was some feedback and I thought that Seth was responding. I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, it was that kind of bad feedback. timing. That kind of feedback. Okay. It was sorry. bad timing. No, no issues. Yeah. No, I, mean, I guess, Seth, you, so, were, you, were, you were doing something different from, from what I'm saying. Right? So, I mean, it's, it's, you know, I would say, okay, it's a little bit different, but it's not so different. So, because these, like I call them effective spin form, so they are somehow spin form motivated. Um, okay. They are using the same variables, like you would consider in spin forms, but in a different setting. I think you will see what I will talk about in the, the talk. So, you, you see how I define these area variables and how they come about. So, you know, be directly using the spin form language, but. Um, it, it's yeah it's all the same kind of variables okay i'll i'll be more patient then. thanks yeah <laughs> sure um okay so um so yeah i split this talk into two sections i will first introduce what effective spin forms are and then um it's um and then i'll give some so the next session will be testing this effective spin form model so there will be some numerics um at the end okay Okay, so, but before I go into what effective spin forms, I just give you a summary of uh, what effective spin forms are in general. Um, so effective spin forms, are, you can consider them as geometric path integrals for quantum gravity, which are based on area variables as I motivated before. Um, and they are, we call them effective because they provide, you can think that they provide spin forms with um, eff efficient and, you know, a very comp computable dynamics uh, to now. So I say this because um, the amplitudes which we will consider in infective spin forms are very simple. And so it allows to do a fast computation compared to all the other spin form models out there. But they are also effective in another sense that um, this I will also talk, talk about during the talk that imposing some constraints which appears um, in the description of these effective spin forms that you can describe like a general family of spin forms. And so in this sense, um, we don't consider these effective spin forms as approximate, but they can be a theory in their own right. Okay. And already, I mean, these models are new, but they've already been used to show that one can recover um, discrete gravitational dynamics um, for in both Euclidean and Lorentzian signatures. So they've been successful already, um, I would say. Okay. So I will begin the first part of the um, yeah of the talk. Um, so, um, so effective spin forms, like as I mentioned, they are discrete path integrals based on area variables. So, when we talk of discrete path, um, because they are discrete, um, like yeah, that motivates us to start from a discrete formulation of gravity, which. Um, has been already introduced by Reggie in the 60s, specifically 1961, um, in the name of Reggie Kaklos. So Reggie introduced a discretization of gravity, and the way he did it is, is to use simplicial decomposition of um, your space-time manifold. So, and in principle, um, or in particular, you assign, yeah, so you first of all, you consider a manifold, you discretize it using some simplices, and then you assign length to your triangulations of your space-time. And this already defines you a piecewise flat geometry. And um, because it's about gravity, we talk of what, what are the curvature. The curvature are distributed on a co-dimension two objects. So if you are in two dimensions, they will be distributed around your point. If you are in three dimensions, it will be uh, edges and so on and so forth. So how you describe curvature in um, the discrete formulation of gravity um, is to um, somehow consider um, all the simplices that are around a point. So for example, and then you calculate the angles inside the simplices and then you, um, yeah, you compute its deviation away from like say your flat value. So in this in this point in Euclidean, it will be the deviation of these angles, the sum of these angles um, uh, around two pi, something like this. And this defines your curvature around um, in these theories. So as I mentioned, in three dimensions, the curvature will be sourced around uh, edges and so on and so forth. Um, 
And Re Reggie already wrote down an action for this theory. And um, we call it the Reggie action. And it's in a very simple form. So in four dimensions, it will be a uh, sum of areas around triangles multiplied by these curvature um, degrees of freedom that I told you about. So these are these epsilon c's are the deficit angles. We call them deficit angles. And you can think of them as describing curvature um, in your theory. And already um, you can write down um, the equations of motions for this action. And this is how it looks like. Um, you only have the variation of the areas because there's a an identity called the Schlafly identity, which tells you that the variation of the angles uh, multiplied by the area is vanishing, summed over. And so you only get this. And this um, approximates Einstein's theory. So, so this is like an approximation of the Einstein Hilbert action, and these equations of motion approximate Einstein's equations. And I mean, there have been numerical tests for these Reggie actions. It's used in the numerical relativity a lot also. Um, so in 40, um, in, yeah, so in four dimensions, the two, the co dimension two objects will be triangles. And so curvature will be sourced around triangles in your uh, triangulation. And already here, um, we can see, I mean, if you look at this action, you can see that, okay, these are the areas and these are the angles. Um, if you look at this Schlafly identity equations, it gives you somehow, it encodes, I say here, it encodes some, uh, the symplectic structure, which tells you that, you know, the areas seems to be conjugate to these angles, um, which looks to be, uh, yeah, which seems nice. But, you know, here in Reggie, the fundamental variables are the edges and um, the edge lengths. And these actually have complicated conjugate variables. If you uh, check the, you know, if you do a symplectic analysis of these things. Um, and so um, here already, we have a hint that maybe using the area variables might be a better option, you know, to quantize these theories. Um, but like as I described, um, effective spin forms are based on area variables. But these, um, yeah, this action that I described you here are based on length variables. But there's a very simple way to go to area variables starting from these length variables. And this is what I described here. So if you consider your triangulation, the building blocks of your triangulations are four simplices. So, um, and each simplex, um, as maybe some of you might know, has 10 triangles and also 10 edges. And so if you want to go to the area formulation, then you can start from this, your regi formulation, and um, locally invert this edge length uh, and area variables or triangle areas. So you can do this easily actually using um, this old formula by uh, Hero of Alexandra. Um, it's called the Heron's formula for, uh, it gives basically gives the area of a triangle as function of these edge lengths. And you can write a set of, like, you know, you write a set of all these equations, there'll be 10 of them, 10 equations, 10 variables, you can solve them. Right, and this is what you can do. And if you do this, you can then express um, the length as function of areas and use this in the Reggie action and you already get your area Reggie action. So this is how you get the area variables, your area action. Um, and um, so already here we can see one difference that if you have this area Reggie action, let's say, you know, these areas are your variables now, not length anymore. If I do um, a simple analysis, you know, what are the equations of motion? I find that these um, curvatures look to be a zero because Schleifle identity still holds. So I find I find somehow flatness, but uh, you know, already it's argued um, recently in the literature, especially by Bianca, that, um, you know, if you think of these epsilons as curvature, um, then you would say it's flatness, but one shouldn't think of this as curvature. And I will give a reason why you shouldn't think of this as curvature, maybe in the next few slides. Um, I mean, maybe the simple reason is because, you know, using the area variables, you uh, lose some uh, shape matching conditions in your geometry. And so these are not only describing curvature, but they are describing something more. Okay. But already, I mean, this is also, it's, 
um, going to this area version, um, it's not it's not new. It's it's also it was already considered. Uh, Hello. Hello. Uh, just yes. to clear a point uh, that I could not understand actually. So when we write the reggae action, so in the action itself, um, the information about the curvature of the space is embedded in the AT terms or where is it like whether it is a negatively curved space or a positively curved space that is being discretized where that information is stored in the reggae action itself. It's it's stored in these epsilon terms. So um, okay. if I go back a little, so here I define epsilon oh, as and yes, like it tells you how much it deviates from the yeah, that exactly. space. Yes. Right, exactly. right. So oh, okay. That's, no. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Um, so, I mean, but area regi action, which I have described here um, briefly, it's different from the length regi action, first of all, because you're using different variables and the equations of motion given different things. So there was already a question posed in the past, does area regi action lead to a discretization of um, general relativity? Um, you know, so I'm not going to answer this question here, but, you know, I'm just saying that people have talked about this uh, in the past. Um, but the short answer is maybe yes, but you have to do more work to get the yes answer. Um, so, okay, so one other um, thing I will consider here is that, you know, now we switch from length variables to area variables. And if you are using area variables, um, and also maybe our triangulations are made of simplices, which are glued together into some complex. And if you look at, every, and the building blocks of these simplices um, are simplices, right? So, or the triangulation are simplices. And these simplices, they glue along tetrahedra, for example. And if you look at the tetrahedra, there are four uh, eight triangles in the tetrahedra. So you get four areas. Um, and if you want to describe the geometry of a tetrahedra, you need six lengths. So there are six lengths to describe the geometry of a tetrahedra. So already here we have like, um, you can get some mismatch information if you are thinking of different simplices. So I say this like if you, because remember I described to you that how you go from length to area is that, you know, locally you solve for some area variables in terms of our length in terms of areas and you use this. If you do this in different simplices, so let's say I do this in this simplex and this simplex, I will get some variables for the areas for this shared tetrahedra and they could be different. So this is the mismatch I'm talking about. And yeah, this is already characterized uh, by Kapovich Milson phase space. And so um, if I want to have a good geometry, I, I want to make sure that these the geometry of the shared tetrahedrons they match, and this introduces some constraints into the theory. So these are the constraints um, that I put here. So you need two constraints per tetrahedra because you have four variables, so you are missing two. So you want to make sure that two of the angles are matching. Um, and it turns out that um, these constraints that you have to impose on the tetrahedra um, are second class constraints. Um, and the implication of second class constraints uh, is that if we go to the quantum theory, uh, we cannot impose these second class constraints very strongly because they introduce some non-commutativeness in the geometry. And if you impose them strongly, um, you will, yeah, you will be uh, breaking this non-commutativeness. And there's a description by Dirac uh, on how to deal with second class constraints and also Gupta Boiler. Um, so yeah, so this is um, um, yeah. So this is how maybe, but we will go to the quantum theory soon anyway. So, um, but before we do that, I will um, introduce two features, which are somehow input from uh, spin forms and LQG, which um, yeah, which then maybe to answer the past question, you know, here we are considering somehow uh, spin form variables, which we will be using. So one input is that uh, in spin forms or in LQG, um, the, uh, there are area operators appearing, and then you can 
uh, if you compute the eigenvalues of these area operators, they are discrete. Um, so I write here. So maybe if you don't know uh, QG, you can take this with a, uh, you can just take my word for it, but um, I think that the area are discrete and this is, um, yeah, they come in this form. So it's proportional to some gamma times Planck length and these J's are spins uh, in LQG or spin forms and the spins are just proper, like you can think of them geometrically, they are your areas of your triangles. Um, and the gamma term here is um, the barbaro mezi parameter which appears in uh, spin forms or LQG2. Um, I, I don't want to spend too much time on maybe explaining this, but just take my word for it. And uh, when it comes... I'm sorry for Go interrupting back. again. Um, if we are uh, doing it in a ADS space, let's say we take ADS and discretize it, um, mm -hmm. then the eigenvalues will depend on the ADS radius, right? Um, because but, then, we, yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, because so what I'm saying- The relevant uh, length scale that is present in the theory, uh, but yes, please go on. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm I'm not sure. Maybe you're right, but uh, so so this is an, like I said, this is an input from uh, loop quantum gravity. Okay. That the areas um, area operators have discrete eigenvalues. So um, yeah, that's that's all I'm saying. So maybe in like ADS, we look at the area operators in general curved space, like some de-sitter or anti de -sitter. Then yeah, whether something like a form has already been uh, done in the literature or? Okay. I'm not sure. Um, can, can I just, um, yeah. I think, yeah, I think sure. you know, I mean, I think Ratan, um, this, this, this is a very general result, right? It doesn't depend on, on any background metric. Okay. No. This, this is, this is something, so, so that's why we call it non-perturbative okay. uh, background independent quantum gravity, right? So okay. now your question is, is obviously very relevant, right? ADS and all that. Mm -hmm. um, but, Deepak, Deepak, I'm very sorry to interrupt. Let's maybe leave uh, cross talk uh, for after the, the, the presentation by yeah. set. Try to have more directed questions just because of time management. We'll have plenty of time for, for discussion afterwards. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Just And also thank you, Deepak. Um, but yeah, it's a non positivity result. That's true. Um, anyway, let me just go on because I have, uh, because of time. Um, so yeah, so another input which I was gonna mention is that um, about the constraints, you know, the constraints came as second class constraints. Am I right it here, which the constraints basically that you uh, enforce that some angles between uh, the shared tetrahedron coming from different simplices are matching. Um, and um, in spin forms, you can impose these constraints weakly using um, some coherent states. Um, so, which uh, you so you pick coherent states, um, which are variables of these spins and angles, and you pick them to be picked on these constraints, basically. Um, so here we made an answer that we pick the constraints to be some Gaussian um, function of the constraints, and um, we use that the deviation of this Gaussian should be um, determined by the uncertainty relation coming from these second class constraints. So somehow then we are using um, these um, second class constraints, you know, um, in in the, um, yes, in the, we call them gluing constraints. We are using this to define how to define amplitudes for these tetrahedron basically. So then we are imposing this weekly. So imposing this weekly in the sense that you see, this is, looks like a Gaussian, it's not, a delta function anymore so you allow some uh, freedom around the uh, peak of these gaussians okay um so already i can already define what the effective spin form model looks like so the effective spin form model then you can think of it as um so if i have your just have a your complex you know a discretized space time then you can define the partition function of this um, as a sum, you sum over all your discrete areas um, weighted by some measure, um, or actually, so you weighted by exponential of 
this Regi action that I described. So SCA is a Regi action. And then to impose the weak, the second class constraints, you use these um, green constraints that I described just right now previously. So which are also here. So these are Gaussians, which are picked on some constraints. Um, and this is the area Regi action. And we choose the discrete, we choose the areas to be discrete. So um, I introduce some gamma and then some J term here. Okay, so this is how you define effective spin form model. You know, this is the, um, so this is what we will want to study as an effective spin form model. If you give me some uh, discrete uh, complex, I can always define this and then try to study what it is. Okay, so, but before we, I go into maybe the second part, um, maybe let me talk a little bit about what the weak, in, uh, weak imposing of the constraints can do. So if you think of, yeah, so I have here, can the weak in, imposition work? So naively, if you consider um, semi-classical limits, you would take h bar equal to zero. And in this language, uh, that would mean taking um, your areas or your spin going to large infinity. And if you do that here, um, we say it, it wouldn't work because um, so the um, partition function has two parts, right? It has the auxiliary parts. So these are the red and the green lines. And then it has a Gaussian part. So in the large J limit, you, know, you have a lot of or highly oscillating. So you have very high, you know, highly oscillating things. And then you have a Gaussian. So if your Gaussian um, is around very highly oscillating things, then uh, it would wash, it could wash away, you know, all, all, all these oscillatory things. And then you end up not getting uh, what, what you want. So the condition that you would like to have is that, you know, that the oscillations under this Gaussian should somehow be of, we, we say it's of order one, which means that you have enough oscillations to, you know, determine the semi-classical limit, but at the same time, um, under the, you allow some, you know, so your Gaussian is not too peaked, but you also allow some wiggle room. So you allow some fuzziness to um, determine this semi-classical um, limit. And we've done this um, for spin forms and then, or even for this um, effective spin form model. And then you find that if you um, put this condition on to get a semi-classical limit, it, it's of this form gamma times curvature times uh, square root of the area should be of order one. So this gives you like a condition on how to achieve a semi-classical limit. Um, so if you do it for uh, just a mechanical system, it it's always comes in this form that one over square root of h bar times the action should be of order one. And this is the, um, yeah. So if you have a system with second class constraints, it looks like this is the condition you need to get a proper semi-classical limit. Um, so already in spin forms, um, there was a question of, you know, that taking the large J limit, if you don't take it correctly, that it brings up a problem, which we call the flatness problem. And the flatness problem is that um, your amplitude, you know, if you do the semi-classical analysis, your amplitude are only picked on flat configuration. So your um, equations, you only get your curvature always vanishes in the box, something like that. Your equations of motion only give flat solutions. And this seems to be a problem because then you don't get general relativity and the classical limit because there is curvature in general relativity. But if you get flat, then, you know, so it was a highly debated issue, um, but it seems that one should take this condition seriously then if you want to somehow eliminate this issue. Okay, so the lessons that we've learned so far is that if you have discrete areas and then you impose these constraints that I have described weekly, then you expect that you know in the um, h by equal to zero large j limit, you have to look for a regime where um, in spin forms this will be uh, gamma, which is the Barbarian Mercy parameter, 
times curvature times square root of the areas should be of order one. So this is the condition you need. Um, and I mean, this condition um, allows sufficient oscillations away from the critical point. Um, so if you want to allow that, then you need the gamma times j to be large. And you know, and over the deviation interval, this condition should hold so that you have, uh, yeah, you have enough wiggle room. Like, you know, you don't, it's your coverage or your constraints are not highly peaked. Okay. And um, yeah, so because you're using discrete areas, so there might be some discretization effects, but you know, if you go to many building blocks, that might take it away. You know? um, so the question is then that does such a regime exist if you want to study the semi-classical limits of these theories? And this is what uh, takes us to the second part, which I will describe about testing these models. Okay, so, um, so yeah, so as I have described, um, in the effective spin form models, using the inputs from uh, loop quantum gravity, um, there are basically these parameters of the model. So there's gamma, which describes the barbarian mesi parameter. And as you saw, it showed up in the uh, discrete areas, which therefore describe some area gap. And it also appears in the green constraints. So it's also somehow described an, an isotropy parameter. There's also the um, parameter of the boundary scaling. So if you have a, uh, if your triangulation has a boundary, then the scaling of your boundary is also another parameter. There's also the curvature, which uh, you can control. You can choose them to be small, large, medium, whatever you want. Um, and so far in the effective spin forms, um, we have test these effective spin form models on uh, this tri triangulation that I, I list here. Um, so there's a triangulation with a bulk area, there's a triangulation with a bulk edge, there's a triangulation with a bulk vertex, and these test different things. So, you know, if I have a triangulation with a bulk area, then I'm somehow testing curvature because um, I only have one bulk area. There's, um, like these triangulations, the reason why I say that is because in these triangulations, there is no bulk length. So you cannot test the classical equations of motion because there's no length variables in the ball. But these triangulations, you can test the length uh, triangulation, the classical equations because there's a bulk um, variable. And also this, because there's a vertex, you can test some diffeomorphisms also. So, um, but today I will, I will maybe tell you this one about the second one, which is also interesting. And what, um, we do in uh, testing these models is we study some observables of some geometric objects. So, and how you define these observables is that you insert uh, the observable in the uh, partition function and you divide by the partition function here. It's just the usual way of defining expectation values. Um, so here we will study some expectation values of some maybe bulk area, or you can study bulk length if your triangulation allow all these things you can study all these things um in your tier in this effective spin form languages okay so as i mentioned i will be focusing on the bulk edge one and just show you some numerics uh, which we have done uh, for these and just to give you an idea so for this triangulation there are six simplexes that four simplexes that you glue together in some way and it allows you to have 21 tetrahedra, uh, 29 triangles, 20 edges. So already, I mean, if there are 21, so maybe the variables we should focus on are maybe these tetrahedra and the triangles because they appear somehow directly in the effective spin forms. Um, so out of these 29 tri triangles, five of them are um, in the bulk uh, because you sum over all allowed values of these area variables and so here in in the um, analysis we chose a symmetry uh, you know we choose a special symmetry of this triangulation so that you somehow your five bulk area variables only reduces to three bulk area variables um, and if also because there are 29 tetrahedra which means that you know you have somehow 21 of these Gaussians so 
Um, already at this level, it's not it's very non-trivial. You have 29 Gaussians, and with all these oscillations, somehow all mashed up together into these partition functions, and you try to study these. Um, and yeah, like I said, I mentioned this particular um, triangulation can test your discrete uh, classical equations of motion, which seems uh, important here. Okay, so um, there's a lot on this page, but I'll try to summarize everything. So the top part here is the uh, partition function that of the effective spin forms, um, in, like in particular, is the absolute value of the partition function. And the bottom two graphs are the air, some observables that I described also, which are the um, observables of some bulk area variables of your triangulation. Um, and here, you know, we chose a triangulation such that the curvature is small. And then on the x-axis, you have gamma, which is your barbaro emergency parameter, which should have, which describes your area gap, basically. And already you see many interesting features here. Um, so there are some oscillations and uh, what's not, but I think the thing you should focus here is maybe on these bottom two graphs. It's that you see um, I have a line here at one. I mean, and this is because I divide the observable by the classical value. So meaning that if um, if the graph here lies on one, then it means it's matching the classical value somehow. Um, and so we see a better fit for this graph that this really, um, yeah, if you state, if you choose this triangulation and you do the simulations, it looks like it's matching the classical value very well in this region of gamma. Okay. And, you know, like I said, there are many interesting features and these, all these features, um, you can study the partition function and they are a good indicator for all these oscillations that show. So, but the um, long and short of the story is that, you know, um, for a certain range of gamma, which is the Barbaro emergency parameter. So here, uh, I would say maybe from between zero and uh, around 0 0.5 or 0 0.6, you get some better matching value for your classical uh, equations of motion. Um, and it even gets better if the boundary scale gets larger, which is good for, um, for um, spin forms, actually. Um, yeah. And, you know, so as I see here, there is also um, between um, 0 0.5 or here and 1.3, it's also matching. So you could also accept these ranges of gamma depending on the scale that you choose. Um, so yeah, you no, know, there are many features of this theory that one can analyze. Um, so I can show you another one for uh, choose a different uh, uh, deficit angles, which somehow medium curvature. And already you see a lot of uh, different uh, descriptions of your partition function. And yeah, all, all these features of the partition function can be somehow explained. So like these peaks, we can explain them from uh, this condition that every time you have this condition, you you get a peak. And also, you know, because I the curvature now is large, uh, now my uh, the range of gamma where these are somehow the classical equations of motion are valid gets reduces, gets smaller and smaller. Right. So I would so here we would say that for gamma larger than 0 0.5, it's worse, larger j is worse than uh, if you are uh, below 0 0.2 or whatever. So depending on the scale, also this region seems to be uh, better, better, yeah, descri describing your semi-classical, uh, yes, semi-classical analysis. Okay, so so yeah, this is kind of um, one one part of the numerics that I wanted to show you. I have several parts, but I, I don't want to show. But the long story is that, um, so using these effective spin forms, we are able to somehow implement the classical equations of motion for gravity. And this resolved the flatness problem in the sense that, you know, you can choose a regime of the gamma where your classical equations of motions um, 
are satisfied, you know, or are good. And so it allows curvature in, in this sense. Um, and also these models are very simple. So one can use this to study a lot. You can check the stability of these models. Uh, for example, you can check um, if we change some details of the model, how will, yeah, how will it affect the, the model? You can check all these things. Um, also, um, like I, I described here that just from the numerics that one gets a larger acceptable range of value for gamma, uh, for range of values for small, small gamma. So if gamma is small, it looks to be preferred. And this is uh, good for the continuum limit of the theory because um, in the continuum limit, you want to consider many, many, many building blocks. And then usually this come with small curvature. And so it, it's good. Um, so what I have described already also give like a hope to restore uh, some of the homomorphism symmetry also in the continuum limit um, and what's not. And um, okay. So I will try and summarize. I hope I'm in time, yes. So um, what I have introduced, I introduced um, these effective spin for models. They are very simple models based on just some disparate radio action and somehow allowing this um, weak imposition of constraints. And the way I describe them, it, they are very much, it captures many of the features that we know from spin forms. You know, and actually, I used some inputs from spin forms and uh, loop quantum gravity. Um, so, and because the amplitudes are very simple, you know, here the computations are several magnitudes more efficient than uh, the traditional spin form models as we know them. And also, this provides actually a mechanism to resolve some uh, problems already in the spin forms, like the flatness problem. Um, like I also mentioned here, you can test some long um, standing open issues. So one thing I did not maybe tell you about is, you know, these um, models can be described also in the Laurentian theories, including both Euclidean and Laurentian. So you can test some issues like, you know, if I sum over orientations, uh, if I sum over degenerate geometries, if I sum over topological changing, things, how will these um, affect the theory? You can test all these things. Um, and then as an outlook, um, you know, maybe the one of the most important thing is to the continuum limit of these theories. And for this, you know, we can test how these theories are, if they are stable under cause graining, um, and also the diffeomorphism is invariance is more important to get maybe some measure on these area variables that I have studied. Um, and already there have been some works on the continuum limit for these theories and in general for spin forms by uh, Bianca, Johanna, and Thanos, Athanasius. Um, also, you know, you can use these models to already apply to cosmology. I think we, we started to do this um, also together with Jose and Bianca. Um, and if you focus on the Laurentian part of these models, you can ask so many questions about, you know, uh, how to apply this or how to, you know, like these models give a well-defined uh, way, like gives a, yeah, a way to define the Laurentian model, but, you know, one has to uh, use some picard lipschitz theory because if you cannot go to the Euclidean, if you want to do the Laurentian brute force, then, yeah, one, one can also do this. It might take you a bit longer or more effort, but it's possible. And in general, um, this, these models, somehow the way I present it, uh, you know, it's like you use some area variables um, and then you impose these weak constraints. So what are the phenomenological implications of using area variables? So these models can be used to test. Uh, some of these implications. So an area, uh, area variables, as I described, it appears almost everywhere. So if you consider area variables as your fundamental degrees of freedom, what are the phenomenological implications? These are all questions one can ask and test um, using these models. Okay, um, thank you for your attention. And um, that's the end.
thank you very much, Seth, uh, for the wonderful talk.